Now, Roma Wines, R-O-M-A, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. Roma Wines present... Suspense! Tonight, Roma Wines bring you Mr. Joseph Cotton as star of The Pasteboard Box, a suspense play produced, edited, and directed for Roma Wines by William Spear. Suspense, radio's outstanding theater of thrills, is presented for your enjoyment by Roma Wines. That's R-O-M-A, Roma Wines. Those excellent California wines that can add so much pleasantness to the way you live to your happiness and entertaining guests, to your enjoyment of everyday meals. Yes, right now a glass full would be very pleasant, as Roma Wines bring you Mr. Joseph Cotton in a remarkable tale of... Suspense! David Waller, taking all of that I can, I'm through, you understand? Through. <coughs> oh, I... Sorry, sir. I couldn't help but overhear you. What's the difference now? I, I hope you haven't quarreled seriously with your brother, sir. Quarreled? What else have I ever done with him but quarreled? Oh, I realize he's a bit difficult at times, sir, but I'm sure he has your best interest at heart. Yeah, well, from now on, he can stop worrying about my best interest because I'm getting out of his life tonight for good. <laughs> rushed out of the house looking wild-eyed and distracted. I caught a taxi right in front of the door and told him to go to the 23rd Street Ferry. On the ferry, I stood by the stern rail. I walked up and down, puffing hot on a cigarette, looking out into the fog and acting nervous and jumpy. I leaned against the rail and bowed my head down on my arms. Two or three people standing around out there began to look at me. Then, when we were about a third of the way out in the stream, I took off my coat had my name and address written with indelible ink in the label, and my hat that had my initials stamped in gold on the sweatband, and laid them down on the deck, and climbed up on the rail, and jumped. It was as easy as that. A fight with my brother that was loud enough so the house man couldn't help but hear it. A jump off the 23rd Street ferry, leaving plenty of identification behind. An easy swim back to shore where I had planted my dry clothes. And a phone call to the news to report my own suicide. It was just as easy as that. On Friday afternoon, I waited across the street until I saw Williams, the house man, leaving for his usual weekend. And then I let myself in the front door and walk back to the study. Come in, Williams. I thought you'd gone. Hello, Walter. Jack. What's the matter, Walter? You look as though you'd seen a ghost. Jack, I... Well, haven't you seen the papers? I thought you were dead. Yeah, I changed my mind. Jack, how could you? How... How could you have done such a thing? I didn't. I just went swimming, that's all. Don't tell anyone I'm here. Yes? This is Mr. Parcell. Yes, I told you once it was broken. I'm... Well, I'm sure I don't know. I know certainly I didn't break it. Yes, it's still in the box. Well, I'll send you to pieces if you like. Well, that's a little late, I'm afraid. Uh... Oh... Well, it doesn't matter anyway. It's, it's, it's the principle of the thing. Besides, I'm going out of town. I... Yes. Yes. I... I suppose there'll be someone here to receive it. All right. All right. Silly. Goldfish bowl. What? Oh, you know, I ordered a larger one, and it arrived this morning, all smashed up, and they were arguing about sending me a new one. There it is in that big square box. You can see for yourself it's smashed. Hmm. That's certainly like you, Walter. At the last minute, you worrying about a two-dollar goldfish bowl. What do you mean, the last minute? Well, you just said over the phone you were going out of town. Yes. Yeah. What's the idea? Well, 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 Jack, I, I uh, was terribly upset when I heard that uh, 
Uh, well, I, I thought... I'll bet. Where are you going? Well, I I hadn't quite made up my mind. I, I just wanted to get away. Taking quite a lot of luggage for just a little trip out of town, aren't you, Walter? Clearing the papers out of your desk, too, huh? Well, I, uh, I simply thought I could uh, get a little work done while I was away. Or were you thinking of staying away for a while because somebody might ask questions about why I jumped in the river and the answers might make you look like a heel? Why, of course not. Such an idea never entered my head. You always were yellow. You'd run away from anything. Jack, that's, that's quite enough. That's right. Those are the truest words you ever spoke. And I wouldn't bother about packing luggage anymore if I were you. What? Why not? Because where you're going, you won't need any luggage. What? What do you mean? This is what I mean. Jack. Jack. No. Oh, you're, you're, you're choking. You're choking. You won't need any luggage anymore, brother. <laughs> Cain felt about able, I suppose. There he was, lying on the floor, looking as though it was me lying there, only it wasn't. It was him, and I was glad. It's a funny thing about twins, being one yourself. You notice them more than most people would. And all the twins I'd ever known had got along good, extra good, but not me and Walter. I hated him ever since I could remember. I hated him because the old man was about the only one who could tell us apart. And it was Walter he always called to him, not me. I hated him for what he got and what I didn't. I hated him because he was always good and I was bad. I hated him because, because the old man left everything he had to him and it wasn't hay either. And because I couldn't do anything about it on account of that forgery rap I'd taken. And I hated him for the way he'd, he'd taken care of me since I got out of jail and thrown it in my face every chance he got. I hated him for all those things and a lot more. <laughs> and I was dead. And I'd killed him. And I was glad. You don't believe me? Brother, I felt great. I went over to the mirror and combed my hair over to the left side like his. And I locked the study door and went upstairs to the bathroom and shaved off my mustache. He was clean shaven. Went back in the bedroom and on one of his suits. And when I got through and stood in front of the big full-length bedroom mirror, I looked a spitting image of him. No one in the world could have told that I wasn't Walter Parcell. In fact, I was Walter Parcell. I went back to the study. All I had to do now was dispose of the evidence. But first, I, I couldn't resist looking around. It was mine now. All mine. Those stupid fish he had all over the place and glass tanks, the books he never read, and all the rest of it. In his desk was a list of all the bonds and securities and the number of his safe deposit box and the combination to the safe and the bank book, all nice and neat. And on the desk was a picture of Helen Winters, the little vexen he was engaged to. And I made a mental note that I'd at least have to call her before I left town. It looked funny if I didn't. <laughs> I might even do more than call her. Well, there was no use stalling any longer. It had to be done. I got the body over my shoulder and carried it upstairs and put it in the bathtub. I locked the bathroom door from the inside. Then I got to work. <laughs> Suspense, Roma Wines are bringing you a star, Joseph Cotton, in the pasteboard box by Joe Grenzebach. Roma Wines' presentation tonight in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Between the acts of Suspense, 
This is Truman Bradley for Roma Wines. Here's a simple secret about entertaining that is one compliment for many a hostess. The next time you have dinner guests, keep them pleasantly occupied during that hour before the meal by serving Roma California Sherry. Serving Roma Sherry before dinner has become a friendly American custom. Yes, glorious golden amber Roma Sherry with tempting fragrance and intriguing nut-like taste is the perfect first call for dinner. And you'll find Roma Sherry equally pleasing with a tasty evening snack, a delightful wine to serve any time. Roma Sherry, like all Roma wine, is a true natural wine, crushed from choicest grapes, grown in California's finest vineyards, then unhurriedly guided to taste perfection by Roma's ancient winemaking skill. Bottle at the winery for unvarying goodness. Delight your family, your guests, with delicious Roma Sherry, now selling at the lowest prices in years. Insist on Roma, R-O-M-A, for uniformly high quality at low cost. Remember, more Americans enjoy Roma than any other wine. And now, Roma Wines bring back to our Hollywood soundstage Joseph Cotton as star of The Pasteboard Box, a play well calculated to keep you in suspense. It was early morning before I was able to leave the house. I walked to the nearest subway with a suitcase, a heavy suitcase, because it was also weighted down inside with old furnace grates and sash weights. I got off the subway at Dykeman Street and took the Dykeman Street ferry to Jersey. About halfway across, the suitcase that I had on the rail, as though it was something to lean on, just sort of slipped out of my hands into the river. I, I looked mad and then foolish, and the people that saw it... Snuck it behind their hands. Well, how was that? <laughs> About an hour later, the same thing happened on a 42nd Street ferry. And the mortal remains of Walter Parcell were gone. All but his head. At first, I hadn't known what to do with that head. It, it wouldn't fit into either of the suitcases, no matter what I did. And then I thought of that box. That big pasteboard box that the goldfish bowl had come in. It was still sitting there in the corner of the desk. I waited it and wrapped up the outside in the paper it had come in and started out again. The 14th Street ferry this time. I had it balanced up there on the rail just like I'd had the others and then... Hey, hey, look out! Hey, oh, it's all right, mister. I got it. I let go. Oh, I've got it. What? What's the matter? I, uh, oh, I, I, I thought you dropped it. Oh, no, here it is. Hey, that was close, all right. Another second, and it would have been gone for good. Yeah. They've been gone for good, all right. Walking across 14th Street on the way back from the ferry, people were pushing behind me, and the next thing I knew, I was in a department store. I was walking down one of the aisles just to keep moving and not to attract attention when... It hit me right between the eyes. There was another box. A box just like mine. <laughs> sitting up there on one of the counters. Next to it was an old guy looking at some bow ties. I walked over and put my box on the counter next to his, and I pretended I was waiting for a clerk. Then, after a couple of minutes, I pretended to change my mind. Uh, I picked up the box, his box, of course, and started for the door. Say, hey, I say that. I say, sir, you've taken my box. Oh, what do you mean, your box? Let go of me. But it is. It's my box. You left yours there on the counter. Oh, you crazy. Let go, I tell you. What's the trouble here? Why, did... Why this man's got my package and won't give it back. Oh, shoplift, right? No, 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 it's not that. He left a package of his own there, but he insists that mine is his. Hmm, what's what? in it? Oh, a parchment lampshade. I bought it in your furniture department just now. Mm -hmm. The girl would confirm that. Crazy. All right, what's in yours? Mine? Yes, what's in your box? Why... The, it, well, it, well, we'll open it up and see. No, 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 you can't. The only way to tell, open them both up. You think this is your package? No, wait, I, I made a mistake. It isn't. Uh, here, now give me mine. Oh, just a minute. Give it to just me. A minute. Give, give it to me. Oh, give it to him. It's his. I saw him put it there. Oh, very well. Thank you. But thank I, you. Why, uh, he acted like a madman. 
maybe I did act like a madman. I guess I did because I was pretty close to panic when I got out of that store. I started walking. I just walked. I, I don't know how or for how long or what, but all I could think of was, what will I do now? What will I do with it? What will I do with it? I didn't snap out of it until I found myself a half block from home and not knowing how I got there. All I knew was I still had that box and I had to get rid of it. Then I saw the sewer. A corner sewer with a big wide opening. I crossed over to it as though I were going to step on the curve. Stumble and gave it a good kick. Slid in and I heard it fall. Oh. I got home. A half hour later, I was just beginning to relax. And the doorbell rang. I went out in the hall, switched on the vestibule lights and opened the door. There stood a couple of kids. Yes, this is yours, ain't it, mister? What? We were standing across the street when you dropped us. Then we saw you come into this house. That's how we know. We got some string on a fish hook and pulled it out. It is yours, ain't it? No. You mean it ain't yours? No, I never saw it before in my life. Now beat it. Oh, then we can open it, huh, Johnny? Oh, uh, uh, wait, no. I don't know. Maybe we ought to take it to the cops. Yeah, you give that to me. Give it to me. But you said... I made a mistake. I didn't recognize it. Now give it to me. Beat it. Well, aren't you glad to get it back? Huh? Oh, sure. Uh, here. Hey. Gee, five bucks. There must be diamonds in that box. It was back. The kids were hardly down this just before I was out the house without a hat, a coat, or anything running toward Second Avenue. I didn't care who saw me now. Didn't dare stop for a taxi. I had to keep running. I couldn't stop for a second. I kept on running up Second Avenue to 59th Street, going out onto the bridge. I was still running, and I didn't stop until I got nearly to the middle. And then, then I threw it. Out over the railing as far as I could. I watched it arc down and saw the pipe splash in the darkness as it hit the water a couple of hundred feet below. It was gone. No matter what, it was gone. Somehow, I got home. But it was daylight before I could get myself to sleep. Monday morning, I felt better. Got up fairly early and went down to study and make my plans. Seeing the picture of Helen Windows on the desk reminded me I ought to call her. If Walter left town without even calling the girl he was supposed to marry, it wouldn't look so good. There was no answer. So I hung up. Then I rang for Williams, the house man. Yes, sir? Oh, oh Williams, uh, I'm, uh, <clears throat> I'm sorry to tell you this, but I'm, uh, I'm, I'm going to have to let you go. Oh, oh I'm sorry to hear it, sir. It's anything I've oh, done. Oh, quite the contrary. I've, uh, found our, um, <clears throat> association most pleasant, but, uh, the death of my brother has been quite a shock, of course. Of course, sir. I'm going away. I don't know how long I shall be gone or when I shall be back or if I shall come back here at all, so, uh, I thought it was best this way. Yes, sir. When will you be leaving, sir? Well, within a few days. There's no hurry, but I wanted you to be able to make your own plans. Uh, I'm making arrangements this afternoon to sell the house and the furniture. And the the uh, associations here are painful. Uh, you understand? I understand, sir. My brother Jack had his faults, of course. We, we all do. I know how you feel, sir. But after all, Williams, he was my brother. Yes, sir. Blood is thicker than water. You're so right, Williams. That first performance left me feeling pretty satisfied. The next one wasn't so easy. But for things to look right, it had to be done. So after breakfast, I went down to police headquarters. Well, what can we do for you, Mr. Parcell? Why, I'm, I'm going away for a while, and uh, I wondered if you had... Uh, 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 recovered my poor brother's... Uh, His body? Yes. Uh, no, I'm sorry. We haven't, Mr. Parcell. Oh, I see. Now, while you're here, though, there is something you might look at for us. Very well. Uh, this way, please. It's just a routine matter of identification, but we like to have these things on the record. You know. Of course, of course. Uh, something you uh, found? Yeah, that's right. Hmm. Fished it out of the East River this morning. The East River? That's right. The East River. For a minute, I just stopped breathing. 
Because it wasn't in the East River that I jumped off the ferry. That was on the other side of the island. The East River was where I'd thrown it. And then I was all right again because I saw what he had. A pair of trousers. Mine. Do you recognize these, Mr. Parcell? Oh, yes. Those are the trousers my, my brother wore the night he died. Uh-huh. Probably kicked him off and tried to swim to shore. <laughs> yeah, well, thanks, Mr. Parcell. That's all we need. Very well, but uh, you said the East River, and it was the North River where poor Jack... Oh, was. carried down by the current and around by the tide. Mm. Caught in the propeller of a ship, maybe. Funny things happen in the waters around this island, Mr. Parcell. Yes. Yes, I imagine they do. So, that was all right, too. When I got out of headquarters, I went across the street to a pay station and phoned Helen Winters again. There was no answer. I hung up. Then I went uptown to the bank, Walter's bank. I'd never been in it before in my life, and I'd been wondering how I'd know who to be chummy to, but I needn't have worried about that. Well, good morning, Mr. Parcell. Good morning. We were all terribly sorry to hear of your bereavement, Mr. Yes, Parcell. Yes, thank you. As a matter of fact, uh, that's what brings me here. I see. Something about the estate? Uh, oh, no, 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 but I shall want to uh, get into my safe deposit box. Why, certainly, Mr. Parcell. Thank you, uh, Oh, uh, by the way, do you happen to know what my cash balance is? Just, just roughly. Uh, roughly between thirty-two and thirty-three thousand. I'll want five thousand in cash. I'll make out a counter check. You can forward the rest when I've made banking connections in Mexico. Oh, Mexico! Mm. What well, do you expect to be in Mexico for any length of time? Oh yes, for quite a length of time. Oh. Shall we go down to the vault, sir? Oh yes, by all means. <laughs> I got out of the bank. It was raining, but I didn't care. I liked it. I was walking on air anyway, and I decided to walk home that way. It's nearly 30 blocks that I was soaking wet when I got there, but what's a little rain to a guy with $100,000 in his pocket? The front door wasn't locked. In I went, and I hung up my hat and coat in the hall and was wondering whether to have a nice hot bath before calling Helen Winters. And when I saw it, it... A box, that horrible pasteboard box that had come back. For a second, I thought my mind had gone. But there it was, sitting on the desk. Wet and soggy and the limp paper peeling off it, as though it had been fished out of the river just that minute. And then I remembered I, I hadn't seen it sink. And what the cop had said about tides and currents. And then the doorbell rang. I rushed to the window. There was a police car outside. For the moment, I thought of grabbing up the box and running, escaping out of the bag somehow, and... And I knew that wasn't any use. It didn't matter. If it was some sort of a police plan, it didn't matter anyway. And if it wasn't, if it was just another one of those terrible coincidences, there was still time. Whatever they wanted, I could bluff it through and there'd still be time. I pulled myself together and went out and opened the door. Yes? We're from headquarters. Yes. You're uh, Walter Parcell. Walter Parcell. They thought I was Walter Parcell. They didn't even know he was dead. That was all right. There was still time. I said, are you Walter Parcell? Why, uh, yes, I'm Walter Parcell. You know a young woman named Helen Winters? Oh, Helen Winters, of course. She's my fiancée. Then I'm afraid you're going to have to come along with us, Mr. Parcell. With you, why? Helen Winters has been murdered. And I might as well tell you now that anything you say will be used against you. The evidence is pretty conclusive. That... that, that I... That I, you murdered her. I, I didn't. I couldn't. We found her this morning in the common report she was killed Friday night. You were seen entering the place that night. You were seen leaving. Uh, a gun that we traced to you was found in an ash can a block away. Now, what do you expect us to believe, Mr. Parcell? Uh, wait a minute. There, there's a mistake. There, there's been a terrible mistake. I... I'm not Walter Parcell. I, I'm his brother. Hmm? I, I'm his brother, Jack. The one who committed suicide? Yes. Only, only I didn't. I, I changed my mind. I swam back to shore. I, I came back here, and I found Walter. He was dead. He killed himself. 
And now I know why. Don't you see? Because he murdered the girl. You didn't report it. Where's the body? The body? Yes, yes, the body, the body. No, no, that's it. Now, look, look. Everyone knew I quarreled with Walton, so I thought they'd pin it on me. I thought they'd say I killed him. So, so I disposed of the body. Then I took his place. We are, we're twins, don't you see? <laughs> Mr. Parcell, I've been in this business a long time, and I've heard some beauties, but I never had a man ask me to believe one like that. It's true. I swear it's true. All right, then, where's the body? I threw it in the river with the weight. I thought so. Come on. Now, wait a minute. Come on, come on. I, I can prove it. I can prove it. Yeah, how? Because, because I've still got his head. His, his head? That would prove it, wouldn't it? Oh, wouldn't it? It certainly would. Come on. I'll show you. Here in that box, see? I'd open it. Sure, sure. I threw it in the river and it got back here somehow. It's, it's still wet, see? It's... <laughs> that doesn't look like anybody's head to me, Mr. Parcell. It's... To me, it looks like just an ordinary goldfish ball. <laughs> That was it, of course. The goldfish bowl he'd been arguing about on the telephone when I came back and found him packing up, running away, because he'd murdered his girlfriend. So, I don't know where Walter is now in those swirling tides and currents, but I know one thing. Wherever he is, he must be laughing his head off. <laughs> Suspense. Presented by Roma Wines. R-O-M-A. Made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. Before we hear again from Joseph Cotton, the star of the pasteboard box tonight's suspense play, this is Truman Bradley for Roma Wines. Each day, more Americans are switching to Roma and discovering what a wonderful help Roma Wine is in making simple home entertainment successful. The reason... Taste. Superb taste for only pennies a glass. And, says famous hostess Elsa Maxwell, there's a Roma California wine to delight everyone. Rich, ruby-red Roma port. Mellow, nut-like Roma sherry. Smooth, golden Roma muscatel. And flame-bright Roma toquet. I give my guests their choice and share with them Roma's goodness. Each of these fine Roma wines may be served with cake, fruit, nuts, or other tasty snacks when guests drop in. Many prefer these wines with dessert. You'll find them delightful anytime. Get Roma wine tomorrow. You'll be amazed how little such taste luxury costs. For Roma wine, famed for uniformly fine quality, is now selling at the lowest prices in years. Insist on Roma. R-O-M-A. Roma wine. Made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. This is Joseph Cotton. I've enjoyed my appearance on Suspense as I always do. Next Thursday, a unique actress whom all of us here in Hollywood love and admire, as you do, will be the leading lady on Suspense, Dame May Whitty. Miss Whitty will appear as a kindly lady whose advertisement requesting genteel part-time employment involves her in a predicament which threatens first her freedom and then her very life. I'm sure we'll all want to make it a point to listen. Oh, oh and, and by the way, if you feel that, that the character I played tonight was a little, uh, well, shall we say, <laughs> extreme, please forgive me. I've never played twins before, and I guess, <clears throat> well, I guess I just lost my hand. Joseph Cotton appeared through the courtesy of David O. Selznick, in whose production, Duel in the Sun, he will soon be seen. Next Thursday, same time. Roma Wines will bring you Dame May Whitty as star of Suspense, radio's outstanding theater of thrills. Produced by William Spear for the Roma Wine Company of Fresno, California. <laughs>